I'm Carissa Christensen, the CEO of Bryce Space and Technology. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about on-orbit servicing and closing the on-orbit servicing business case. What does it mean to close a business case? Uh, it's really the combination of resources to establish a firm, technology to offer products and services at a competitive price, and ultimately customers. Uh, space businesses generally have some challenges in closing their business cases. Uh, space businesses, particularly hardware-based businesses, are capital intensive. There is typically a long period of time between the initial investment in a space business, the point where product is available, the point where revenue uh, begins to cover uh, costs, and uh, the point where eventually, hopefully, returns are sufficient to cover uh, investment uh, and, and generate returns uh, to, to the uh, initial investors. Space businesses often have a complex relationship with the government, which may be a funder of initial technology or non-recurring costs, uh, a regulator, sometimes even a competitor, as in very often a customer. And so, of course, that can also be a positive attribute of space businesses. And finally, a challenge for space businesses is price competitiveness when there are terrestrial alternatives. It is just about always cheaper to offer a particular service terrestrially compared to from space. And um, uh, breaking that barrier is a major challenge for space businesses that do compete with terrestrial firms. On the other hand, space businesses have the advantage of the attributes of space, the unique, uh, you the unique environment, the absence of gravity, ubiquitous ac access to points on Earth. Space businesses have the advantage today of significant government requirements for space-related activities, for exploration, for um, and national defense. Uh, those budgets are growing. Government interest in, in commercial solutions is growing. And so that is a, a very positive element of, of closing the business case in space today. And finally, space businesses have the advantage of benefiting from increasing capabilities and decreasing costs so that increasingly efficient space activity on satellite manufacturing, satellite operations, and launch that can have broader uh, impact. Looking very specifically at the on-orbit servicing business case, typically we'll need to see significant investment in technology and market creation because normally uh, most of these markets do not exist today. So it takes time and resources to help potential customers understand the application, position to use the application, and then make the sale to those customers so that they do use the application. Uh, it takes alignment uh, with the government, both as funder and customer, and it takes tolerance for a long period prior to significant investment returns. In that context, I'm going to talk through the specific markets and what's driving them to, to really try to provide some insight into what's needed to close the business case of on-orbit servicing firms. And I'm gonna use a definition of on-orbit servicing that's very broad. I'm going to talk about um, servicing, assembly, manufacturing, to try to fully illustrate the differences and dynamics of those market segments. So there are three broad in-space uh, activities that are gonna drive demand for on-orbit servicing broadly uh, described, over the next decade to decade and a half. First, satellites and the supporting value chain, satellite manufacturing, satellite services and the supporting value chain. Second, human exploration and the support of human exploration. And third, R&D and space science beyond those uh, activities related to satellite servicing and um, satellite services and human exploration. So let's walk through each of those broad areas of activity and talk about what on-orbit servicing markets emerge and what those markets look like and what's driving them. And that's really the, the, the core of um, closing a business case is finding customers that want this, the, the service or product you're providing. So uh, looking first at uh, the satellite value chain, uh, 
my company, Bryce Space and Technology, has assessed uh, uh, these markets and identified six of the most promising. These aren't the only. Uh, certainly, I'm not saying it's impossible for other servicing activities uh, to emerge, but these, in our view, at this point, uh, given uh, what's going on uh, uh, among potential customers, uh, seem to be the most promising. Uh, and I'll uh, first uh, inspecting a satellite, uh, likely to go up close inspection uh, using a servicer to help determine the cause of anomalies. Second, extending mission life by using an external vehicle to take on station keeping or attitude control uh, or refueling to extend mission life. Third, moving satellites and really moving large satellites from one location to another, from a test to an operational orbit, from one operational location to another, or even into a graveyard orbit, either through a tug kind of function or by refueling the satellite to move itself. And just of course a note, uh, extending mission life and moving satellites are both um, functions that we have seen uh, recently uh, demonstrated. So uh, this is no longer an entirely theoretical set of uh, market applications. The fourth area that appears very promising is uh, if increasing defense resiliency through satellite protection or satellite capability upgrades um, uh, using a non-orbit servicer or servicing capability. Uh, fifth, servicing, uh, uh, specifically manipulating or repairing or adding components to restore or enhance a satellite's capabilities. And enhancement is an important uh, potential element, that ability to insert new technology into an on-orbit platform. And finally, uh, LEO de active debris removal in low Earth orbit, um, removing debris or removing satellites um, uh, from LEO. Certainly there is debris uh, th th removal in the, uh, in the GEOARC, but we'll consider, we can kind of consider that in that moving large satellites um, uh, category. There are certainly other potential markets that we considered assembling satellites, um, LEO deployment of satellites. We saw that with uh, ISS, LEO to GEO uh, tugs or orbital uh, transfer vehicles, uh, persistent platforms and recycling and salvage operations. Uh, those markets may emerge, but uh, face some more, uh, some additional barriers. Talking about the six that I identified as the most promising, they're in the, you know, range of tens of million dollars uh, annual markets and, and we, over the next say five years and some are um, emerging, some are this now, some will emerge. And then in the, you know, from five to 15 years from now, they generally have the potential to reach the range of hundreds of millions of dollars a year at a moderate to high level of probability. So what's driving those markets? What's, what's driving that probability? It's really the underlying drivers of the satellite value chain. And, and in this brief time, I'm gonna highlight two. One is the emergence of uh, LEO satellites. This will come as a surprise to nobody, uh, that the dramatic increase in the number of smaller LEO satellites creates opportunities uh, related to servicing, particularly, um, uh, but not exclusively debris removal. I will note that the, the number of satellites that have been proposed now is, I, I think, over 50,000. Um, we will not see that many satellites on orbit. There will be systems that succeed. There will be systems that do not succeed. As in any emerging business area, as in any competitive business area, there will be winners and losers. And so um, uh, while, while certainly we will see more LEO satellites than we have in the past, it's important to realistically calibrate what is likely. Uh, the second driver for the satellite value chain is um, geosatellites. The geosatellite market, commercial market, has been uh, constrained over the last several years. There's, a, there's a, an uptick right now. Um, generally speaking, the, the key thing with regard to geosatellites is their longevity and the length of their development cycle. And so, um, the, the fact that from concept to deployment, it can take, uh, you know, 
four or five years for a geosatellite and a satellite can be on orbit for 15 years is important for servicing um, applications that, for example, require a different satellite design to be truly effective. In that case, the long lifetime of a geosatellite um, really means that the emergence of a market for that new application will, uh, will come slowly as those long-lived satellites are, are taken out of service. Um, so moving from the satellite value chain to the second area that is creating demand in the relatively near term, five to 15 years for um, on-orbit servicing, uh, human exploration. And the, the five human exploration markets that we identified again as promising, recognizing that there may be others, are um, uh, managing an uh, orbital platform, assembling and maintaining, modifying uh, components of a platform. We hear about 3D printing of uh, components for the ISS, for example, that happens today. Uh, demonstrating uh, servicing capabilities or manufacturing or assembly capabilities on a planetary surface to prove technologies that are required for sustained human presence on the moon or Mars. Uh, and then in addition to demonstrating, th there's a market for actually assembling and maintaining that uh, surface infrastructure, which can be a launch or landing pad, an in situ resource utilization system, power systems, propulsion systems, rovers, landers, and so on. Fourth, uh, assembling or deploying spacecraft, particularly for use in lunar or Mars orbit or, or for long distance travel. Um, and then finally, refueling surface landers, uh, refueling crew and cargo landers to support uh, um, missions uh, to and from Gateway, for example. So those markets um, are uh, driven by um, human exploration. And what really drives human exploration today is the government. Um, there are certainly, so, so the end user, the end payer, for just about all exploration activities today uh, is, um, is a government agency. That's not to say that there's not really important commercial opportunities associated that, with that because uh, government agencies are increasingly open to uh, working differently with companies to take advantage of um, and leverage uh, company innovation and um, capabilities to share risk, to share design decisions, to share architecture uh, uh, decisions. And so um, that both the increasing level of government exploration and that, you know, that acceptance and tolerance toward or desire for uh, partnership with industry on the government side to both enhance capabilities and potentially reduce costs, create opportunities that will drive demand for on-orbit servicing. Emerging demand areas associated with exploration are tourism, and um, orbital tourism is priced at tens of millions of dollars, most likely. Uh, that is uh, challenging um, in, in, in that there's a really relatively tiny population of, of people that constitute the addressable market, but it's a non-zero population as that price comes down. The number of uh, potential space tourists will go up. And then also there's an interesting area that we might call um, billionaire legacy programs, where there is an advocacy viewpoint around the value of humanity living and working in space, uh, living and working on planetary services and um, uh, funding that comes uh, from uh, extremely high net worth individuals to support that vision. So, uh, the third area that I want to talk about, promising market, uh, uh, markets for R&D and science, really looking at uh, R&D and science activities that are not supporting the satellite value chain or human exploration. So uh, there, there are three interesting markets, assembling large scale spacecraft, where a, a spacecraft is uh, really beyond the reach of current launch envelopes servicing space telescopes, extremely high value assets to extend their lifetimes, uh, uh, replenishing fuel or non-fuel consumables, and manufacturing goods in space for use on Earth. Uh, these markets are um, minimal uh, right now. They really emerge 
either through a specific requirement, a specific mission need for a massive spacecraft, uh, a telescope anomaly, or a, 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 you know approach to end of life, or a breakthrough in uh, uh, research that uh, identifies a good that can be manufactured in space at a price point that is competitive terrestrially. And typically what we see with regards to manufacturing goods in space is uh, there's, a, there's huge R&D value, there's, a, there's learning, and then that learning can be applied to a less ex uh, costly terrestrial manufacturing technique. But there certainly are uh, products that are under investigation that may be uh, uh, appropriate to manufacture in space and that can be sold at a price that is um, uh, competitive with the terrestrial alternative. Uh, uh, you know, some options that are under consideration are uh, very advanced fiber uh, or um, uh, organs or, or um, uh, manufactured retinas. So uh, looking at all of those markets together, there's, um, as you can see, there are very diverse drivers for those markets. And um, uh, what they do share though, are some common, um, uh, common attributes in, ter in terms of the meta market. Interestingly, decreasing launch prices and increased launch capacity can actually tend to, in some of these market areas, reduce demand for on-orbit servicing or assembly and manufacturing because it may be less expensive or more feasible to develop something on the ground and launch it. Uh, on the other hand, um, software-defined satellites or satellites that uh, accommodate uh, hardware insertion uh, drive uh, demand for uh, on-orbit servicing. Also, um, uh, breakthroughs in manufacturing, also uh, the um, potentially uh, increased defense needs of um, uh, major nations for space are going to drive demand for on-orbit servicing. Um, the one final point, two final points I'll make. One, the value proposition associated with on-orbit servicing is actually twofold. There's the revenue associated with the servicing activity, which um, uh, as we've talked about, may you know, reach a billion dollars plus annually in the next uh, decade or so, or even more, um, uh, with the uncertainties that I highlighted. None, none of these markets are, are, are certain. Uh, this is a, a, a process, a developmental process. Um, in addition to the revenue that I, as a servicer, might receive, there's also value that I create. If I'm able to extend the life of a satellite by five years, um, I will get paid my fee, but then that satellite generates revenue for its owner for years and years to come, and that revenue may be significantly more than my fee. If I'm able to remove debris and create a more operable space environment, many users may benefit from that. And so it's an interesting value proposition in which there is a clear um, uh, specific revenue point that, that uh, I can identify with my service, but there's also a positive externality to uh, serve, uh, often a positive externality to servicing activities that creates additional value. With that, I'll conclude with the, uh, just a reminder um, that the answer to what closes an on-orbit servicing business case is the answer to what closes a business case in general. And that answer, the first and most important answer is customers. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. And um, uh, thank you very much to Astroscale for making this possible.